I guess I'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody. I'm John Marinowski. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> um, I work on the White Mountain National Forest and I live about four blocks away from here in Plymouth, uh, love this town. Uh, great place to live, great place to raise kids. Um, I've been in my job about 12 years now and um, today I really want to talk about to you about different opportunities on the National Forest that you'll find for volunteering. And, uh, and you know, you may think about, you know, the, the classic um, ranger, you know, is out maybe hiking the trails or is out doing trail work. And that's some of what we have to offer, but we have a lot of different opportunities from things like giving information at at a visitor center or at a front desk to very arduous tasks like those I just mentioned, like trail work and, and backcountry patrol and things like that. So I'm going to get into all that. But um, So I work on the Pemmage and Wasset Ranger District, which is just up the road at exit 27. Who's been up to our building, to the Forest Service? All right. So uh, we're, we're very lucky to have a beautiful facility. Um, I would encourage all of you to come and visit us. I mentioned this before, historical interpretation. Um, another place to, to look for opportunities is volunteer.gov. We put a lot of our opportunities on volunteer.gov. And this particular one is up, up there. Um, the guy who runs this program works on the Saco Ranger District. And um, it's a pretty impressive what they do what they do out there. So if that's something you're into, that's definitely something to uh, drop them along. Bruce, do you mind, um, sorry to put you on the spot here, do you mind talking about trail adoption a little bit? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Um, just to uh, kick us off a little bit, so like I was saying, we have 1,200 miles of trails on the National Forest, and working in the White Mountain National Forest is interesting because when I first came here, I'm like, who are all these different groups? Who is the AMC? Who is who does Dartmouth do? I thought they were like an elite college, you know. I, you didn't know they maintained the Appalachian Trail and, and some of the shelters on the AC. Um, so coming into this job, I had to learn. I learned a lot about working with different clubs, and we're really lucky to have all these partners um, chip in to help us with trail management. Um, but we have a lot of miles, about 450 miles of trails that the Forest Service maintains. And um, Bruce Richards, who I'd like to introduce, is one of our volunteer um, trail adopt, adopter lead um, coordinator. coordinator. And I'll let you take it from there. <coughs> I'm Bruce Richards. I'm the uh, coordinator for the trail adopters in the, uh... no, that's all right. Leave, leave the camera over there. <laughs> <laughs> John said there's 400 and some odd miles of trails in the uh, White Mountain National Forest. Within the Pemi District, we have about 220. Um, we have 75, 80 trails, uh, depending on, on how we segment it. Some of the trails are fairly long and they involve quite a bit of work, so to make it easier for an adopter or maybe make it less intimidating for an adopter, we've segmented them. Uh, if you've been on the Aminus Ravine Trail, uh, from the Forest Service parking lot up to the uh, the, the spur for uh, that runs to Marshfield Station, that would be one. The spur would be another one, and above above that junction would be a third. So we have one adopter for the lower half of that, and another one for the upper half of it. The Jewel Trail is another one. Uh, some like the Kineo are splitting up because they're fairly long, and there's a lot of work in there. So um, we have. Depending on how you do it, we've got, uh, I would say, 67 to 70 uh, adopters right now. Uh, some of them have adopted a trail by themselves. Some have adopted more than one trail. Um, some will do it with a co-adopter or with a buddy, 
and then some are the, li the liaison between a group and myself in the Forest Service. So we have a whole gamut. If, if anybody's reluctant to adopt a trail by themselves, uh, you can do it with a buddy, a co-adopter, or as a formal group, and we have a bunch of different groups. So, um, for, for trail work, we basically have our adopters do three things, and in this particular order, priority. Water is the enemy, so we want the drains and the water bars cleaned. And we would like them cleaned in the spring after the snow has melted, and again in the fall, this is minimum, and in the fall again after the leaves have dropped and before the snow flies again. All right, that, that's the primary objective. The next one is to keep the trail corridor open. Am I on the screen, Dave? It's okay, just slide that way a little bit. That's it, thank you, perfect. So the second one is to keep the trail corridor open and to do that we brush back the encroaching vegetation or clear out the blue mats. And as I tell the adopters, if you find anything about which you're not comfortable doing or handling or it's beyond your level of experience, let me know. If I can't handle it, I'll send it up the food chain. All right, so I frequently will go out with adopters if they have issues that they don't know about or they want a risk assessment done on the trail. We'll arrange for a time when I can go in and do that. And the third thing on the list basically is just blazing, and that's done every so many years. I mean, good putting together a handbook for us, and uh, we've really done a lot of planning and um, looking strategically at this program. So. There's been a lot of volunteer time invested. So, um, sorry, let me go back. This is the classic setup for the Trailhead Sewer Program. It's very simple. It's, it's a tent. See that canopy tent up in the upper left? It's basically a tent, some maps, and people with a little bit of training to talk to the public about how to stay safe. So we talk about weather. We talk about being prepared. We talk about changing your plans. You know, maybe you don't want to do this hike. Maybe you're not up for a 10 mile hike. Um, so it's really make, making that contact with hikers and giving them a quick, it's like that elevator speech, you know? It's like you get that quick interaction. You hope that what you say has made a difference. John, that one day that I was able to do it last summer, we, we must have turned, I was at the bridal path. We must have turned away 15 or 20 people because they didn't know we convinced them that it wasn't yeah. better off doing something else. Yeah. And the old bridal path is, is the meat and potatoes of the program because in the, from 8 to noon is our typical shift. We're actually expanding our shifts this year. From 8 to noon, some of our record days, we talked to 600 people in four hours. And we're not just clicking everybody, we're clicking those people we're having a conversation with. You know, so a, a little bit of a dialogue. It's not just a whole hello, but it's some interaction. John, yeah. have you thought about having your trailhead stewards there in the, the mid-afternoon? Yeah. Because there are a number of times I've had people going up my trail at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and it gets dark at 6 and they've got an hour and a half to go to get up there and at least two more to get down and they don't have a flashlight, they don't have headlamps, they have the light on their camera. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I get them to turn around. Yeah, so the planning team this winter has, has been going back and forth about where, which areas we want to expand um, shifts. So we're basically going to have a second shift at a lot of our trailheads. So like Old Biopath is going to have an afternoon shift. Some of our other trailheads like Gulf Sticky will have an afternoon shift. Um, so, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy, and Christy's going to talk about this in a little bit. But we've we've been lucky to we've been working with Fish and Game. Um, New Hampshire Fish and Game is in charge of search and rescue throughout the state, um, and we've been working closely with them to go through their data um, for the past five years and really figure out well where are these happening. What are the causes? What's the time of day? And it's been super interesting, but a lot of work because these reports, and so I see you know, Kristen in the back has helped us with some of those efforts. Um, but you get the, 
file folders and you know they're this thick and that's like three months worth of search and rescues. So so I just kind of I went into my next slide, but wire stew is very important because we're hoping to prevent this because if you're unaware, when somebody gets injured in the backcountry, it takes a lot of people to carry them out. Usually, I would say 15 to 20 people to carry to carry somebody out, and it's never that really tiny, skinny person. It's, it's always the, the bigger people that seem to get injured. <laughs> So it takes a lot of people because they constantly have to switch out. And if you think about some of our trails that are narrow, I mean, you're like, mm -hmm. you get, get knocked with brush. and it, It's hard work. It's really hard work. So I'm going to um, let Christy take the floor. Christy is our intern from Plymouth State. And she's been pouring through this data day in and day out. Yeah. So. In the last month, we got the data from the middle of 2012 to the beginning-ish of this year, going for the uh, search and rescue both in the state and then on the White Mountain National Forest. We documented over 730 cases in the last five years, and that's the 2005, 2015. So here's some of our training coming up, April 8th is the trail at Stewart training I was talking about, which will focus on the trail at Stewart program and backcountry control. Um, trail adopter training May 20th and June 4th. Bruce, do you guys have a location for that? Well, typically we run it on the um, on the Yale River Trail, well, the second one. Uh, we're not entirely sure where the first one will go, but we try and pick a trail where we have a number of structures fairly close to the parking lot. Yeah. Because to many of the trails, you have to go quite some ways to get into where the work is being done. So um, we, haven't, we haven't decided yet, but we will probably look in the next week. Okay. So check the website. Is that what would you suggest? Uh, if, if people want to know, I guess email me or you or Jody. Any, okay. any one of us would, uh, would have that information. Yet. Okay. So I've got to sit down with Jody and maybe with, when does Mike come on? Um, not until mid-May. We'll have to know before. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. You know, we had an attendance sheet going around. Please sign that. Um. <laughs> 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 no, <immediately. laughs> Here, I can report. Um, volunteer.gov is a great source of information, especially if you're looking nationwide. I like to look at different opportunities out west and then think, oh, when I retire, maybe I'll, maybe I'll work out west and live out there. Um, grab one of our flyers, of course, um, and we have business cards um, that we would love to hand out and they uh, basically give you a quick snapshot of the volunteer description of the duties and some contact information. and. Um, you know, come to a training session near you, or give, give me a call, give your local office a call, and say, hey, I'm interested in volunteering, how can I help? Um, thank you. Any questions? I think I'd like to make one more thing. It's funny when I sit down and I think of something else to say. <laughs> <coughs> I started hiking when I got out of the service in 71, and uh, I, I've, if, if it counts, I've just about done it. So, um, I remember one of the things that I would say as I go along, why don't they take care of this? How come they haven't taken care of that yet? You know, this needs to be done. What's the matter with those people? Well, I guess who they is now. So it, doing trail work uh, not only gives us a chance to give back, but it's also a wonderful opportunity to make improvements to something with a wonderful sense of accomplishment at the end of the day. You've done something, you've made the improvements, and it's there for all. And uh, those improvements are truly I can say from personal experience are truly appreciated by those who provide. So think about it. Join us. We need we need trail developers. So not only in the Pemic but in the Saco and I would guess up in the Andro as well. So you probably have had experiences on trails where you see that there was work that needed done. 
needed doing, a mud pit that needed to be drained. So get involved, it's fun. Questions? Canton office. <coughs> 93, exit 27, hang on. Is that one right? Oh, we're on the bridge. Under the highway. You gotta go to the left. All the signs to the left of the highway right there. Right off the highway. Nice building. Yeah, you should come check this out. Sam Knowles, who has been with the Trailhead Steward program, would like to say. Sure. A couple years ago, uh, I found out through the AMC or one of those organization that uh, they were looking for trailheads to it. This that sounds kind of interesting. So I write out did an application and then a few days later the phone rang. And that uh, one says, Oh hi Sam and on and on and on, what should that one way done? And so that's how I started and this will be my third summer here. Uh, I will do the down hooks it and I've done um, <coughs> three of the locations this past year, I decided that I would pretty much uh, spend my time at uh, Long Waters and uh, Coney Notch for a couple of reasons. It's easy to get to, and uh, there's a tremendous number of people uh, in four hours. And it's also.